And so we walk the halls of this church or other places and say things like, how are you doing? And before someone answers, we're on to something else. We don't have deep conversations all the time. We don't interact and connect in a way that provides for deep development, deep spiritual development. So this morning, as we continue to talk about making Christ the center of our lives, we're going to talk about the importance of moving beyond uh, service connections that we might have and finding something deeper. Over the last four weeks, we've been in a series where we've talked about how in this church, as, as a person here who's a part of the community at Crosspoint, how do we make Christ the center of our life? That's our model. Our model here at the church is to make Christ the center of our life. How do we go about doing that? We've looked at four things. The first thing that we've done, we talked about the importance of worship and the importance of being in a worship service like we are here. Right, it's important for believers to come together and gather together and open up the Word and sing together and have that, that encouragement time together because it kind of centers us. It brings us together for the week. It reminds us of what we share. It reminds us that we are not alone. And it reminds us ultimately of how great God is. The next week, we talked about the importance of Bible study in this idea of growing. We think that everyone at Crosspoint should be involved in studying the Bible on their own and also studying the Bible in a group. We believe that because we believe that these are God's words for us. And if God has given us our, His words, then we need to know them and we need to spend time in them. So we want to grow. Last week we talked about the importance of serving. All right, that Christ came to serve, and so we are, in our lives, supposed to be serving as well. And so we encourage people to look for places in their church community here, where you can be of service. The young and the old, everyone has a place. We need all of us. And today we're going to talk about connecting. The importance of having real and authentic relationships that will aid us as we seek to become more and more like Christ. Now, some of you over the past four weeks have heard all these things and you're thinking, the church, the church wants to monopolize my time. They want me to be here every week. They want me to be here all the time. And they want me to bring money every time, too. You never ask for that, all right? But we don't want you to feel as though we're trying to add things to your calendar. Some of us, we might actually need to add something to our calendar. If you have no place for any of these four things, then, then maybe you need to, to make some choices in terms of priorities, because studying the Bible, being in, in worship service, finding a place to serve, and being held accountable, these are good things. These are important things. But there are others of us who are thinking, oh my goodness, I have three Bible studies already. I serve in four places. I go to worship here, and then I worship at home. I, 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 there's, a, there's a show I like to, or a, a TV a preacher that I like to catch. I worship there, and then sometimes we go over to this other church on Sunday nights. We worship, worship, worship. How am I going to add accountability? It may be, and you'll almost never hear a pastor say this, that you need to do one less Bible study. It, it may be that instead of serving in four places, two is enough. It may be that you need to make some choices in terms of your calendar and in terms of your priorities so that you're hitting on all four of these things instead of hitting heavily on one or two. We think that all of these things are important. So it may be that you don't have to change anything. 
We just have to do it in a different way. We're not asking you to add a knife. We're just asking you to switch something out. But that would be different for each person. This morning, I would encourage us, all of us, to find time in our calendar and in our schedule to meet with other believers so that they can help us to make Christ the center of our life. I'm going to encourage each one of us to connect. That's where we're headed today. So I want to be honest about that at the front end. The word accountability came up a number of times in that video, and it's a word that we're going to use a lot in this, this time that we have together. And I always think it's important to define what we mean by a word like that. So I looked it up in the dictionary. That's what I was always taught to do as a kid. If you don't know what a word means, or if you're looking for the dictionary, you look it up there. And this is what I found. It says that uh, accountability is the fact or condition of being accountable. Now, I was also told as a child that you shouldn't use the word to define the word. And so when I came upon this, I was immediately angry, right, because they did not have Mrs. Musser for a grammar class as I did, or they would have known that you don't do that. So then I looked up the word accountable. Accountable means having to justify our actions or decisions, being responsible. So now we're on a good path. Now we have a definition we can work with. Accountability is encouraging others to be responsible in their actions and decisions. But we want to take this definition and we want to bring it into the church context. We want to bring it into the context of how we interact with other believers. It's not done in a vacuum. You don't hold yourself accountable, which we'll talk about later, but it's developed a relationship with other believers. So this is the definition that we have, the working definition of accountability, that we are developing relationships with others that will help us, uh, help me to make Christ the center of my life by evaluating my relationships with God and with others. And when we're talking about accountability, we're talking about developing relationships with others that will help me make Christ the center of my life by evaluating my relationships with God and with others. That's what we're talking about here today. And in order to help us see that, there's a number of places we're going to look in Scripture. The first place I want us to go is Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. If you're using the Pew Bible in front of you, Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. It's about two-thirds of the way to the end. Jesus has been teaching throughout the New Testament. And in this particular portion that we come to, he's specifically been talking with religious leaders of the time. You'll hear the word Pharisees and Sadducees, and those will seem odd to us, but those are words for the religious teachers of the time. Jesus is interacting with them, and they're frequently coming up to him with questions, trying to trap him. If you've ever worked with kids, you know what this is like. You know, they'll come with a question. And then you give an answer, and then they have a retort very quickly. Jesus was dealing with people like that quite often. And at one point, a Pharisee comes up to Jesus with a hot theological topic of the time. A question that people, young Jewish people, older Jewish people, would sit around and debate. So this was an important question. And he comes and he brings it to Jesus to see if he could test Jesus, if he could trap Jesus. So I want to invite you to stand if you can as we read this passage together. Matthew records, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Father, as we, as we read your word this morning, I pray that we will be attentive uh, to what it says, to what it means for us, to what we need to do differently, to what we need to continue doing. Lord, help us to be changed by this for your glory. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. So the Pharisees' question is a big one. One that we might want to ask as well. We come across the Bible. There's so much in here. There's so much here. What's the, what's the one that I focus on? What Jesus does is really something that's amazing. He brings all of the law in together and sells it in really just two statements. He says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest. But he doesn't stop there. He brings a second that is like it. It says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It says, all of this, all of the law, all of the prophets depend on this. This is what it looks like when Jesus is the center of our lives. How do we, how, how do we evaluate ourselves? What will accountability look like? It will boil down to these two questions. 
these two ideas that Paul has just given to us, or, or, or Jesus gave to us, rather. Am I loving God? And am I loving others? Two general questions. Am I loving God? When we're being held accountable, held accountable, we're being held accountable to this concept. One of the hardest words in this passage is that word, all. Because if I ask you, do you love God with your heart, with your soul, with your mind? Many believers would say, you know what, I do. And they would be honest in saying that. I do love God with my heart. I do love Him with my soul. I do love Him with my mind. But when we ask that question with the word all in there, we get silence. You get the occasional person who just really doesn't understand themselves. Like, I don't pull that off. Right? But most of us look and we see that we're all we're like, I can't. It doesn't work. I, I might love my family more than God. You might love your job more than God, your career more than God. You might love a sports team more than God, a political cause. There are parts of our heart that God does not have. Am I loving God with all? And the answer is always no. Now it will look different for different people. Some people will struggle in this area. Some people will struggle in this area. Some people, uh, you, you know, it will be harder for them to love God because they're loving this or they're loving that. That's why accountability is so important so that as we develop those relationships with other believers, they can ask a, the, the, the question that is for you. Are you loving God more than your spouse? Because they know about your relationship. Are you loving God more than your things? Because they know you love your toys. It's important to have those relationships, to be accountable to other people. But it doesn't end there. It doesn't end with just, do we love God? And he continues on. Jesus says we need to love our neighbor as ourselves. And we hear this one a lot. But everyone always not. Oh, yes. We need to do that. We should absolutely be loving our neighbors. Right? But then when we go out and we actually have to live that way, it becomes incredibly difficult. Sometimes, and, and, and the word neighbor here, you know, that just basically means everyone. But sometimes I have trouble loving my literal neighbor. I mean, some of you, you, you pull into your, car, into your garage and you turn your car, it's an attached garage. You literally will wait until the garage goes all the way down before you get out of your car so that you do not have to interact with your neighbor. Some of you feel like me, you live in a house where it's detached, you put it in your car, you crown that car. And you get down so that no one will see you because you don't want to interact with people sometimes. Do you love them literally? Just start there. It becomes hard, does it not? Listen, I've had many, many opportunities and many occasions where I've had to look at myself and say, you know what, I'm not loving people the way that I should. And when you're in a good, accountable relationship, someone will call you on that. I remember probably midway through my time as the youth pastor here, and I have shared this story before. But we were on a trip with uh, another, a couple other youth groups. And uh, it's fun to be on a trip with other friends who are youth leaders and stuff. And so uh, you're able to talk about what's going on in your church, what's going on here, and share ideas. And, and at one point, some of our students did something wrong. And I went to hold them accountable. But I went in anger. And I, I can cut with words. You know, I'm not going to fight people very often. I mean, you look at me, you don't think... Danger, right? <laughs> I, but I, mean, I can cut with words. Just and I opened the door. I looked at these guys, the teenage guys, and I just cut them down. I left them in tears. I was proud of myself. I go down to the other youth pastor, I'm like, you're never gonna guess what I just did. I told them this, that, this, this, this. They're crying. So I thought these other guys would laugh. And one of them looks at me and he's like, I, I cannot believe you said this. And, and what's interesting is the guy who said that, nine times out of ten, if, if I were to ask you, who do you think would have said that, him or me, you would have picked him. Because he's the mean one. I'm the nice guy. And he said, you need to go apologize. And I went back up there and I told him, listen, you're wrong still. But I was wrong in how I handled this. I wasn't loving you the way that I should. Held me accountable in that situation. I think everybody in here has some relationship with some other person that they need help with to love them the way that God wants you to. For some of us, it's the person who lives in the same house as us. You have a hard time loving the person that you're with. For others of us, it's an in-law. It's a co-worker. It's someone in the neighborhood. It's a friend. It's a family member. It's someone who we haven't talked to in years, but when we think about them, we're mad. And we're not going to be able to love that person the right way, the way God has asked us to, unless he does a work in our heart. 
And quite often, he uses those accountable relationships with other people to remind us, you need to love people as Christ has loved you. We need accountability for that. Sometimes we'll ask ourselves, though, if that's the, the, the what, all right, why? Why do I need this? Why do I need others to help me here? I see that. It's important. Love God with all. All of me. It's important to love others as myself. But I can work on that on my own. Why do I need other people? Romans 7, Paul gives this wonderful uh, six verses that for me have been just so helpful in looking at and understanding kind of who I am. You can turn there or you can listen as I read, but Romans 7, verses 15 through 20, this is what Paul says. And as he says this, I hear my own heart. Paul says, I do not understand my own actions. I don't do what I want, but I do everything I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I can do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is my flesh. And here he goes. For I have a desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. I don't do the good I want, but the evil I don't want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I want or what I do not want, there's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. It almost sounds, I mean, it's almost sounds schizophrenic in a sense. I love this. I don't, and when you read it, it's hard. I had to practice this before reading it in front of you. I do this, I don't do this. But isn't that how we feel sometimes? That's how I feel. Why do we need to come to Because we're like, Paul, oh, first off, I do what I shouldn't do. Every day, I do something that I know I should not have done. Every day. Some of us need to steal from work, from other people. Some of us want to run out of our marriage. Some of us want to run into a destructive relationship. Some of us waste time on needless things. It'll be different for each one of us, but we all do things we shouldn't do. And the beauty of an accountable relationship is that someone will ask you a specific question about yourself because they know you. Did you look at what you should have looked at today? Where did you go online? Because they know that that's what you struggle with. I'm constantly confronted with things in my life that need to change. And when we're in an accountable relationship, we get the encouragement to stay away from these things. This isn't policing each other. We're not starting some sort of you know, cross-point Gestapo that's going to follow you around and say, I know what you did today. I've been watching you. No. We're talking about developing passionate reminders to stay the course, to flee from poor choices, encouraging people from a grace centered stance to glorify God with our bodies, to glorify God with ourselves. We need other people. This is something society understands. One of the great marketing things of the past 25 years has been this phrase that friends don't let friends what? Drink and drive. Believers don't let believers. What is it? Those who follow Christ aren't going to let each other what? We need accountability. We need other people because we do what we shouldn't do. But we also need accountability because we don't do what we should do. You think, well, I've got this whole thing down where I'm not doing what I shouldn't do. Now I have to worry about doing what I shouldn't be doing or not doing things. I can't keep it straight. <laughs> I don't do what I should do. This happens a lot. I know I'm supposed to forgive that person, but you know what? I'm not going to do it. I know that I should be doing that, but I am not going to do it. It helps to have someone say, hey, did you read your Bible? No, but it should. Have you been praying the way that you're supposed to? Are you caring for other people? There are many times that we don't do what we should be doing. And really all we need is a reminder from someone. Because sometimes we just forget about it. We're in the middle of basketball season at my house. Three kids playing games, like my whole Saturday. It's like running from game to game. I would like to tell you that the basketball is so high quality that it's amazing. You, know, you put a first and second grade out there and play basketball, the quality of the game is not what you're going for. And you're waiting for the snap at the end. <laughs> this year I'm coaching a fifth and sixth grade basketball team. Half of my game as coach is sitting there reminding them and screaming, but in an encouraging way. Okay? <laughs> it is. All right, put your hands up. When you play defense, put your hands up. Simple concept. All right? But they require a reminder. And every time I yell that, the hands go up. Put your hands up. Hands go up. They're not doing what they should be doing. Their hands are down. I have one kid puts them in his pockets. I told him, Mom, don't put them in shorts and pockets. This is basketball. What's he going to put? What does he need? Put them in pockets. Right? Hands up. Hands up. And I remind them time and time again. And then the hands go up. All right? This is what we do as well. 
as Christians, we remind each other, listen, get your hands up. Be ready. See what's coming. Now, some of us are going to develop really good excuses. Oh, yeah, I know why I need accountability, but you don't understand. I hear what you're saying, but listen, I'm such a strong Christian that I don't really need other people holding me accountable. I can do this. I don't, I don't need that. Usually people, and I know people who've taken that stance, and then they prove themselves later to be wrong. Some people say, I don't want other people to know about my struggles. I understand this entirely. We're not asking you to walk into a room with people you've never seen before and unload your deepest, darkest secrets. Frankly, that would be weird. Right? But what we are saying is that as we build relationships and develop relationships with other believers, we will find the safety and the grace with others to say, here's where my struggle is. Here's where I need help. Please pray for me here. And then sometimes people will say, I'm accountable just to me. But I don't think that really works. We need accountability. And so the last question I have is how? How can we have real accountability? How? Well, real accountability first, I believe, requires the gospel. The kind, of require, the kind of accountability that we're talking about here this morning requires the truth of who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and why it matters for us. Paul, in Galatians chapter 6, gives a wonderful a few verses on just the beauty of accountability. He says this, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, he says. All of these things, the beautiful things about restoring people in gentleness, bearing each other's burdens, it, it gives us a picture of what accountability looks like. Paul doesn't say scream. Paul doesn't say yell. Paul doesn't say embarrass. He says restore gently. Bear their burden with them. That's what it is. We're walking alongside of one another, bearing those burdens together. No one is alone. But one of the most important words Paul uses here is when he says brothers. Of course, during the time that Paul's writing, when he writes brothers, everyone understands he means brothers and sisters. He's saying believers do this. Because what he's, what he's making clear is that this kind of accountability finds its footing on the truth of who Jesus is, what he's done, and why it matters. So that ultimately we bring people back to that. Because sometimes all of our human reasoning isn't enough to get someone to right the path. And we have to say, remember, that we've been called as believers to make Christ the center of our lives. How is your action reflecting what Jesus has done for us? That sometimes is where we need to go. Because emotionally people are not there. Relationally we're not there. Sociologically we're not there. But theologically we should be there. It's about what Jesus has done. Real accountability requires that shared understanding. It also requires relationship. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 is one of the best little passages on relationship and the importance of it. The writer says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. If one falls, the other one will lift him up. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. A threefold, threefold, threefold cord, excuse me, goes on to say, is not quickly broken. But what a beautiful picture of accountability. That you're walking alongside someone else, you fall, and they pick you up. It says, woe to the person who has no one there to lift him up. See, we know the struggles that we're going through. There's somebody here today, I'm sure, who thinks no one has ever been through what I'm going through right now. There's a chance that that's true. There really is. But the likelihood of that is so small. There are people in here who have walked through all sorts of things. Sickness, death of a loved one, um, you know, the dissolution of a, of a marriage, uh, substance abuse, all sorts of things. Pride, whatever it might be. There are people in here, other believers, who suffered through something similar to what you're going through. And that's why it's important to come together. That's why a relationship is important. So that someone doesn't hound you, but someone comes alongside of you and picks you up when you fall and is there for the phone call late at night and is there to pick you up and is there to come over and directs you back to Scripture. It requires relationship. And relationship scares some of us. It really does. 
But Scripture is full of example after example of example where, where godly relationships spur us on to godly growth and ultimately to God's glory. And that's what we want. The last thing is this, that real accountability requires honesty. Honesty. John, Jesus says that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The, the ultimate sense in that is, of course, knowing of Christ and knowing the truth of who He is, what He's done, why He's done it, and why it matters for us. That brings a great freedom. A freedom from thinking that life is about what we do. It's about pleasing God and who we are and not about who Jesus is. When we understand that it's not about what we do, but about what Jesus has done, that brings great freedom. But the idea that, that truth brings freedom in general is beautiful. The truth, when brought into the light, when it's no longer allowed to fester in the darkness, when it, when it comes into the light, no matter how difficult sometimes that truth is, there will be freedom. Honesty is, is much easier when we remember who's at the center. It's not me, it's not even the person holding you accountable, but it's Christ. There are a lot of other verses and passages that are listed here, and I encourage you uh, to take time to look through those this morning, or, or later in the day, rather. There's a lot here today, but I'm hoping that what we have here will help us to start down the road towards accountability. And as we're here today, there's probably people in a number of different places. Some of us will look and say, you know what, I have a good accountable relationship with other people. There are other believers who aren't my spouse that are holding me accountable. And to you I say, good, keep that up. Keep working at that. Let that be a model for the rest of us. Some of you heard this and you know, and you're like, this is what I need. This is what I'm ready for. I'm ready for this kind of connection that is going to help me to make Jesus the center of my life in areas that I've been struggling with. And there are some that hear this and frankly, you're, you're afraid. I don't really want someone getting too close. I don't want someone I have to talk to. I don't want someone who's interested in me. I like to float in. I shake a few hands. I smile. I like to float out. I'm going to keep floating. Right? I understand that. In all of these circumstances, no matter where you're at, your first step is to pray. Your first step is to be honest before the Lord and say, here's where my heart is. This is what he talked about today. I don't know if I like it, but here's where my heart is. And if you want me to do different, then you're going to need to change my heart. And I believe God will do that. So here's the challenge that I have for us as a church. It's this. We want everyone to have an ongoing relationship with another believer or believers that provides real accountability. And if that didn't pop into your mind right away, well, here's the relationship that I have, then I want to give you some suggestions of what you can do. Some places at our church where you can find those kind of ongoing relationships with other believers that will provide for real accountability. First, we have things called core groups. A core group is a gathering of men or women, all right, and they gather together three to four people and they meet intermittently to discuss life, to hold one another accountable, and to encourage each other. We do not, at present time, have a specific program for that. It's you looking around and saying, I'd like to have a core group. Here are two other people. I'm going to ask them. And you form a core group. You don't have to register that. You don't have to come and fill out paperwork. It's just you do it. All right? You do that. That happens because of something you choose. We have a women's mentoring program that is getting ready to kick off. There's information about that in the service program. If you're interested in knowing more about that, you can read there. Right? We have a celebrate recovery program that offers fantastic accountability. Through their Friday night program and through their step studies, it's been something that a number of people in our church and in our community have been able to utilize to God's glory. There's information about CR in our service program. There's information about CR on our website. And they have a table outside today in the hallway that you can walk by and talk to people who are in CR and see that they're normal people, all right? They're good people. And you can learn more about Celebrate Recovery. And then today, what we're, what we're excited to talk about is our community group program here at Cross Point. Some of you will say, I've never heard of this. I didn't know we had community groups. Well, it's something that is new. It's something that's been prayed about for about two years. It's been in the planning stage, and today we're ready to talk more about it. Some people have been in community groups since October, 
And the reason that we had some roots going already is because we wanted to work some bugs out, make sure that they were good and ready for all of us when we're ready to be a part of one, if that's what we choose. A community group is a group that meets at least twice a month with the purpose of accountability and fellowship. Sometimes, but not every time, they share a meal together. In this group, we want to foster a deeper love for God and for others through these kinds of meetings. There's anywhere from 8 to 12 people in a group. Some groups are just for men. Some groups are just for women. Some groups are for couples. Some groups have younger families. Some groups are younger people. All right? Some groups are, are some of our more seasoned people. Some are blended in that aspect. There will be a place for everyone at some point so that no one can look and say, you don't have a group for me. We're working on that. These are for people who want to build a deeper connection here at Crosspoint. They're for people who are looking for grace-filled encouragers to help them along the way. They're for people who are looking for connection and support. My wife and I are part of a community group. We meet twice a month. Uh, and we are a group of foster and adopted families. So we are able to come together twice a month, talk about what is going on in our life, what's going on in, in, at court, what's going on with families, with birth families, with biological families, with our families, lots of families. And we're able to talk about that together. We're able to encourage each other. We have some people who will say, here's what we're going through. And someone who says, I know about that. And they're able to encourage one another. It's a beautiful thing. We love it. It's one of the highlights of my month. Or every two weeks. I don't know how to say it. It's a highlight. Let's say it that way. It's a highlight. When we get together, we don't do Bible study. We don't open it up and someone teaches. Usually we talk about what was a said in a sermon. Sometimes it's a little awkward because I'm the one who preaches. I usually start it off. I say it was phenomenal today. It was beautiful. I cried two or three times. I know you all think the same. Let's pray. All right, but that's what we do. We talk a little bit about the sermon. We don't roast the pastor. I mean, don't say, well, I just, you know, when he was going through that one point, it's just terrible. And the joke, I mean, bad. And what was he wearing? You know, we don't, we don't do that. All right, we talk about what was said. Then we talk about what's going on in our life. And we pray together. It's a time that, that's, that's meant to be together and to share. Do you have to be in one? No. Uh, you're not going to get a, a, a letter in the mail that says you've been assigned to a group. Um, if you choose to not be in one, we talked about maybe just sending a group to your house. You know, getting about 10 people together and sending your house with a crowd. Like, we're here for community group. Like, oh, so now you're in one. But we're, we're not going to do that. We're not going to force anybody. We're not putting people into groups arbitrarily. But this is what we are asking. If this is something that you're interested in, and I know I have done a, probably a half decent job of explaining all of it, but if it's something that you're interested in, on the back of your welcome card, there's a place to check that you're interested in community groups. If you check this box, it doesn't mean that you're in one. It doesn't mean that we're going to assign you right away without discussing anything with you. But it means that we will know that we should come to you with further information. And if you check this box, if you drop this card off or contact the office this week, someone will get back to you within the week. We will let you know what is going on. And then after that, in the next two to three weeks, maybe four weeks, we hope to have these groups set up and let you know which one you're a part of or, or work that out with you. But it's going to take a little time. I want you to understand that this is something new for us. And whenever you start something new, you will find that there are bumps in the road. And some of you, unfortunately, will be a part of the bump. And I want to, in the forefront, apologize for that. If you don't hear back from us right away, it's probably a clerical error. Although our clerical people never make errors, it's probably my fault, all right? But something may happen. We aren't ignoring you. We aren't abandoning you. We're working on it. If you feel like you need to send an email to ask what's going on, feel free to do that. Because we want everyone to feel like they can be a part of this, and we want to have a place for everyone. There is a chance that if we have a certain amount of interest, that we may find that we don't have enough trained leaders. In which case, we will let you know that as soon as we have a trained leader, we will have a group for you. But again, you're not being abandoned or ignored. We're working on it. Okay? I just want you to feel, feel that up front. That we may make a mistake, but you are not the mistake. My final plea in all of this is to pray about it. Because some of you uh, are excited and some will just be totally uh, nervous. So go home and pray about it. As we prepare to close, we're going to sing a song uh, that reminds us that we need the Lord. Reminds us that we need Him. 
Because in all of us over these past four weeks, I hope that uh, even though we talk about the importance of needing others, as we do in our relationship with Jesus, we talk about the importance of needing people to serve and, and needing to be a part of the community, our ultimate need is for the Lord. Our ultimate need is for Him. And so we want to remind ourselves of that as we close with this song. Will you stand?